So in our last video, we looked at how the complex refractive index of material is affecting light as light passes into that material and how that is manifested as absorption or emission. In that case, and in previous videos, we talked about how we need an induced dipole moment in order to get absorption. And so that is relying on there being induced dipole moments. And that doesn't apply to metals. For this video, we're going to talk about what happens when the solid that our light is hitting is a metal. So first of all, think about what's happening in a metal. We have electrons that are free to move. And so they are not bound to anything. And so what that means is that if you have a piece of metal in a, just a static electric field, there's going to be a force F given by minus E, E, where the little E is the electron charge and the big E is the electric field, each electron is going to feel that force. And it's going to force the electrons, it's going to accelerate them, they're going to gain velocity, and they're going to move in the opposite direction to the field. And they're going to gather on one side, while, while the other side of the material is going to be getting more and more positive as its electrons are pushed over to the other side. So we get this pile up of electrons on, on the surface of the metal on one side of the conductor, and we get a surface that is now depleted in electrons and so has a positive charge on it. And because we have those separated negative and positive charges, we've basically induced an electric field. So now we have an electric field that is posing the external electric field, and so it's modifying what's going on on the inside. For a conductor, a metal, we've got electrons on one side of the metal and a net positive charge on the other from all the missing electrons. So our electric field goes to zero inside of the metal. That means that we're not going to get the same sort of interaction as we do with our dielectric materials. Remember that our electrons are, are mostly just not bound to the parent nuclei. They're free to move around. So instead of being like the Lorentz model of solids, where you have springs that are connecting things, there is no restoring force that is acting on the electrons. The electrons are free to move. They can just disappear off in one direction. Now, if you've got an, a varying electric field, like with light, where it's going backwards and forwards, the electrons are going to change direction according to the changes in the field. So as the light passes through, the electrons move in one direction and then the other. So you're going to have a negative here, and then they're going to start moving back that way, and then they'll move back that way, and then they'll move back that way. And how fast that turns around depends on the frequency of the light. This takes some energy, right? You are passing energy to the electrons by having them accelerate in one direction, and then they're accelerating the other, and then they're accelerating the other. And so you do lose energy from the light, but it is not bound to anything. So you don't get the same effect. So you don't have spectral features. You get absorption of energy across pretty much all energies, but you do not get a nice spiky feature like we see for the dielectric materials at least the ionic dielectric materials. So let's get into this in a little bit more detail. I want you to consider that we've got the oscillations that come from the light that is passing in towards the solid and the free electrons are now being affected by that varying field. So I've got an equation of motion and this is similar to the one that we came up with before for our dielectric function, but now it does not have the restoring force component. It does not have the spring constant component. It has an acceleration of the charges. So we've got a mass Me, mass of the electron, and its acceleration. We've got the frictional piece. This is the damping coefficient and the speed of the particles. Remember this delta is just the displacement of the, of the electrons now. All of this action, so the acceleration and the friction, this force that's acting on here is given by the electric field. And now our electric field is this time varying field where this I omega T is the omega is the frequency of the light and the A zero is the amplitude. And this is our damping coefficient. So again, this is the acceleration of the electron due to the electric field. And this is the frictional damping force. So it is dependent on the speed of the electrons, but now we have a force that is also coming into play because of the electric field. 
and a reminder, no restoring force. So that's where it's different from the dielectric materials. So here's that equation again. And we talked about this before that basically what we've got is the electrons are just gonna follow the field. And so our electron displacement is gonna be given by amplitude and the wave function. So now we want to differentiate this to get the speed. So I've got the differentiation. I get my I omega, down, my minus I omega pulled down. And now I'm gonna differentiate this again to get my acceleration. So now I've got the acceleration due to the field and it is minus omega squared times D zero uh, EI omega T. And remember that this part here is just the same as the displacement. So now I can put this all back in. What I've done is I've taken this equation and I've divided through by the mass of the electron. So that's now down over here. So I've got minus EE over ME. So this is all on one side. And now in here, I've got the acceleration and that's this omega and I put in the delta in here. And this is the frictional damping component. And so again, I've put in the delta in here. So I've got this equation and this can be rearranged so that we've got the delta on one side and everything else on the other. So now I've got an equation for the displacement of my electrons in terms of the electric field and the frequency and the damping function. So this looks similar to what we had before, but now the mass is the mass of the electrons and we have no restoring force. So that's that equation again. And I want you to think about what's going on here. Remember, we talked about this in the previous video. The polarization of a material is given by the number density of the electrons, the charge on the electrons, and their displacement. Here I've got an equation for my polarization. But also remember that the polarization is given by the dielectric function or permittivity of free space, the susceptibility of the material and the electric field, and then we have this D, which is the electric displacement. And that again is just the electric field times the permittivity of free space plus the polarization. And we also defined this displacement as being the relative permittivity times the electric field. So those are all things that we talked about in a previous video. All I've done here is to pull all of that together. We've I've basically just taken this ER here and put, put it into equal to this one. And now I'm going to pull all these things together. So I've taken this equation for the relative permittivity or the dielectric function. And I've got the first part here, which is just a free space part. And then I've got my polarization part. And so here's the polarization here. So I've got an N E delta and I've put in this delta part here. And so now I've got an equation here, but you'll see that there is an electric field in all three components. So now I can get rid of those. So now I have an equation for my metal, for my conductor, uh, for the permittivity or dielectric function, even though it's not dielectric, in terms of the permittivity of free space and the, the number density of the electrons and the damping constant and the frequency of light. And so we can, we can see that we've got something that allows us to see how this varies with wavelength. Now, I'm going to define this value, which is the number density of the electrons, the charge on the electron and the mass of the electron. And remember, those two are just constants. I'm going to define this as this omega p, which is actually the plasma frequency squared. And so that just gets rid of this bit here and turns it into omega p. So now I've got the dielectric function for my non-dielectric conductor uh, in terms of the permittivity of free space, the plasma frequency, the frequency of the light that's hitting it and the damping coefficient. Let's look at this in terms of what it does for the reflectivity of metal. I've got that same equation again here. If we've got a good conductor, that gamma term, which is the damping, that is to do with the friction that the electrons are feeling, that becomes negligible. And so this term just disappears. And so now we've got an equation that just relates the relative permittivity to the free space permittivity and the plasma frequency and the frequency of light. Remember that the relative permittivity is a complex number. So I've got the real and imaginary parts of the complex number. And so now I want you to consider the dielectric constant, dielectric function or permittivity of free space, how it's made up. So it's made up of these two components, which are the real and imaginary parts, which are related to the 
complex refractive index. And now I want you to consider what the refractive index of free space is. So in a vacuum or free space, we have an N, a real part of the complex refractive index is just one. It is just, it is not changed from the speed of light. It is the speed of light. And we have no absorption. There's nothing in there to absorb anything. So the K part is zero. And so if we plug this in, what we find is that the imaginary part goes to zero and the real part just goes to one. And so epsilon naught, the dielectric function for free space really is a constant and it's just one. So now I've got this function that is the dielectric function, relative dielectric function of our material that is related to this plasma frequency, which remember is related to the number density of electrons. So here's that equation again. And now we're gonna consider what that means for what's going on inside the material. So here I've got the reflectivity equation that we derived in a previous video in terms of the complex refractive index. And I've got the complex refractive index in terms of the complex dielectric function. If omega is less than omega p, if omega is less than that plasma frequency, then this number is greater than one and this number is now negative. And so this number is negative. And so the complex refractive index is imaginary. If we take this so that omega p is equal to omega, now this goes to one, this goes to zero, and so we have a complex refractive index of zero. When we have an omega where it is greater than this omega p, the plasma frequency, this number becomes smaller than one, this number becomes positive, so n becomes real, and so we actually have a real component to our complex refractive index. Effectively, what this means is that up to the plasma frequency, the reflectivity is essentially just one. So if you look at this equation here, if I put in m equal to zero, what I'm going to get is that this just goes to one. So effectively, what we have is that the reflectivity is just unity. But as soon as omega gets above the plasma frequency, now we're going to have a reflectivity that is decreasing. And as the omega goes higher and higher, this number is going to get um, higher and higher too. This is going to get smaller and smaller until it reaches zero and omega equals infinity. If we consider just the first part up to the plasma frequency, basically what we've got is reflectivity is 100%. That's going to be true up to the plasma frequency. And that's why metals look the way they do. They're so shiny because the reflectivity is essentially 100%. It reflects everything. On the other hand, if we think about what happens once we pass and get higher than the plasma frequency, now the reflectivity is going down and down. And in fact, the metal will become transparent. And so as the reflectivity drops, it's going to become uh, more and more transparent. Uh, but that happens at very, very high frequencies. So in this video, We've gone through how the optical properties of metallic solids behave differently than those of dielectric solids. And we've talked about the reflectivity of metal and why it's shiny and what happens when we get to really high frequency.